In the late 90s, a game company known only as Rare began developing their, I don't know, third magnum opus at this point? Maybe fourth? Well, now Larry's deciding to chime in. They were the undisputed kings of the fifth console generation, being one of Nintendo's only third-party developers who stuck with them after the N64 revealed that it was still using cartridges. Nintendo had given the James Bond license to Rare around the start of 1995, and they had rejected it wholesale. They had just finished shipping Donkey Kong Country, they weren't about to start working on a gritty action shooter. Reportedly, only one developer was actually interested in the project, and brought on a team of exclusively brand new developers who had never created games in a professional environment. It was going to be an on-rails like on shooter, similar to Virtua Cop. In case you want to learn more about the development of the game, I highly recommend the Errant Signals video on shooters from 1997, which this entire section is basically plagiarized from. Essentially, the game was going to suck. God said, hey guys, this is a film adaptation releasing two years after the film with an entirely inexperienced and underfunded crew, but then Rare said, FUCK IT! GoldenEye combined the boomer shooter style with the Virtua Cop style of aiming, and had somehow created a game that would be remembered for generations to come and revolutionize the FPS genre. But what happened after GoldenEye's release? Time just kept going. Rare went back to what they were doing before with completely wholesale platformer titles with no problematic aspects to them, and James Bond were just kept coming out, but were obviously never as highly reviewed. Agent Under Fire sure did pretend to exist, hypothetically. Tomorrow Never Dies was promising considering its existence as a Game Boy Color game until finally the most widely praised James Bond game released. And that was, of course, 007 Racing. Okay, now what we're really here to talk about. Don't love me quietly. Do it with intensity. This is Nearly Civilized, performed by Astero. The introduction song of Nightfire is likely its most memorable and important aspect. Immediately after putting in the disc, we see the title screen alongside our titular Pierce Brosnan. After pressing start, we see this introduction, and then we are shoved into the first mission before we even have a chance to enter the AV settings. This style of introduction is pretty rare for movies, and even television likes to keep these introductory sequences as methods of introducing each episode's different crew, rather than just because it's cool. One might expect that after the first mission is beaten, the game would stop showcasing this OP, but it still shows up after every single launch. Agent Under Fire and The World Is Not Enough were published under the same publisher, if not developed by the same team, and didn't have anything like this. Going back to the origins of James Bond, the first novel was written in 1953 and was followed by approximately too many f***ing sequels, which were well received, until James Bond started getting adapted to films in the early 60s. GoldenEye was the first James Bond film to not be based on a pre-existing property. It was also the first film to feature a practically unknown actor at the time. Nightfire was the first James Bond game that used traditional actors in a completely original story. Thanks in part to a laser scanning process that captured the features of his face using over a quarter of a million data points, Brosnan's Persona as 007 brings the Bond film star into the hands of game players. And similarly to how Goldeneye was trying to prove that the film was as viable a method of delivering stories and action as novels, Nightfire uses its story to show how video games can be used to the same effect. The fact that the way they tried to express this was by having a traditional Bond-style intro in front of you each time you experience a new scene is really interesting but then I would be skipping over the intro itself. We see the world set in the barrel of a handgun, similar to the intro in most Bond films. The gun retreats before James picks it up and moves around a little. Then some Bond girls do some moving around. That's pretty impressive. Then the missiles, oh my god. Then some martial arts, and we're back where we started. It's pretty tame in the visuals department, but it really shines in La Letra. Sorry, I'm practicing for my Spanish final. Was it, was it good or? No, just drop We start with a verse about sex. Before continuing to the highlight, we are nearly civilized. I could almost love you now. We will throw this building up just so we can tear it down again. GoldenEye plot recap. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the different nations fall into infighting. 006 is revealed as a traitor who is planning to spark a global war using a super weapon, simply for financial gain. It's a much more interpersonal conflict than we were used to at that point. Nightfire tells the story of one man's plot to ignite a global war using a super weapon for financial gain. Hey. Hey, wait a second, this is just Goldeneye again. Granted, going into the finer details, we see a great deal of difference. The enemy isn't a former friend, just a business mogul. We never encounter any governments as an enemy, but the main thing we need to take from this plot is its retelling from the story of a different medium. We will throw this building up just to tear it down again. On an unrelated note, one of the paths you can take in the first mission is a segue. Why do I call Nightfire the sequel to Goldeneye when clearly 
it isn't. It was an entirely different staff, publishing company, and even Millennium, and it was even a sequel to a former James Bond game, Agent Under Fire. Characters from that game reappear in Nightfire even. And, I mean, fair. But then we look at the introduction of the game. Agent Under Fire doesn't even do the gun barrel thing. Obviously, this is objectively inferior. More seriously, Nightfire is taking heavy inspiration from GoldenEye. The introduction sequence and plot, as aforementioned, but also in the gameplay style. I've mentioned that GoldenEye has a manual aim feature, which was pivotal in basically all combat encounters. Well, Nightfire has that right here, even though it's entirely unnecessary. There are control settings that are available to change at any time. The default is called Classic Bond, and it's the GoldenEye control style with the C buttons being gracefully replaced by the C stick. But right next to it is the true control system, simply called Nightfire. It's modern dual analog, perfectly implemented in this game from 2002. This is the intended control style, as shown by the fact it's literally named after the game and also the game is entirely balanced around it. In GoldenEye, enemies have extended and exaggerated pain animations to help the player deal with crowd control and taking off enemies in groups. Watch the Iron Signal video. In Nightfire, those are entirely absent. Enemies are just bullet sponges, unless you get one-shot headshots which are much easier given that modern control style. The idea that the enemies are bullet sponges is also important to the gameplay. GoldenEye had an incredibly rudimentary stealth system, which was pretty incredible for 97, watch the Aaron Signal video, but now that enemies shoot their unsuppressed weapons without warning because of their increased reaction time and increased pain tolerance, going through stages without being spotted is both incredibly difficult and incredibly necessary. Going to what most people consider the peak of the game, level 2, Alpine Exchange. There are three and a half main paths to take through this mission. Starting on the roof of this building, you can wait about a minute and jump into the ship and truck to sneak right in and have a certified bond moment. Or you can jump over the edge and run into this ravine where you can pick up armor and a bond bonus. We'll get back to you later. Then use your phone grapple to make it to this ledge where you can sidle across some windows. If you don't get spotted here, you can get a certified bond moment. Or path three, the more direct approach. Hold this guard up, steal his gun, and become a war criminal on the side of the British government. Then you can advance through the courtyard in a myriad of ways. If you took a stealthy approach, you can just walk in, missing out on an opportunity to cut the power to the searchlights, even though there aren't any searchlights on this path. Or you can witness the most echolalic conversation in existence. That's not a joke. Me and my brother will always randomly quote this section out of nowhere. It's so good. Or if you arrived the truck, you will be invited to save this poor old man and get a bond bonus. After entering the party, the game gets more linear. But then you can choose to kill these guys, run down the stairs and complete the objective before running down even further and completing the mission, or you can break out the window and get a certified bond a moment. Then run backwards to collect the briefcase before running back down and finishing the mission with the climactic boss battle. See your score. Oh. Uh, yeah, maybe I should talk about this game's invisible difficulty system. GoldenEye has been widely praised over time for its difficulty options, including different objectives. Watch the Errant Signal video. This makes the entire game locked behind being more skilled. To experience the true Bond story, you have to be skilled like Bond. You can't just soak up bullets from ten assault rifles simultaneously. On the easiest difficulty, you can just murder pivotal characters for fun and continue on your way. Now, looking back at Nightfire and why I believe this is the true sequel to GoldenEye, there was a clear attempt to implement the system into the game, despite how this game would be telling an original story that more people really need to experience. They couldn't just guess what was happening because they already knew what was going to happen next. All objectives are available on every difficulty level, but crucially, you aren't actually experiencing all the actions. To get a different medal at the end of each mission, and by extension some killer upgrades, you have to do all these things. Your average bonus objective in GoldenEye would look something like destroy all alarms. In the first mission of Nightfire, if you want to get enough bond moments to get a platinum medal rating, you have to cut the power to the searchlights. It's a way of subtly guiding the player into playing as though they have those higher objectives without feeling like you're missing out on the original story. This theme of non-linearity isn't as present in the rest of the game as I would like it to be. Five of the game's 12 missions are incredibly linear vehicle missions, although there are still a few moments where the developer's true intentions shine through. In the first mission of the game, Paris Prelude, you get bonus points for shooting tires instead of killing people. In Island Infiltration, if you wait for the gate arm to let you through, the alarm doesn't sound until you leave. All these little touches lead to an experience which feels much more free than it really is. The way that Bond forces you down these linear pathways that you have to find yourself is pretty impressive. Let's take a look at one of the worst missions, Night Shift. James has to climb up a skyscraper to get some information, and he goes about this by using all his gadgets. The player might be inclined to find the passcode to this door by reading it off one of the computer systems, but Bond would simply crawl through a vent instead, which is actually quite a bit slower, but still inspires us to view the game as a sort of playable film, a term which I hate, but that's a topic for another video. It's a really impressive effort, making the story and gameplay interlocked in a way that was clearly attempted on N64 hardware but couldn't really be achieved because Nintendo was being stubborn. 
And on the topic of that story, <laughs> it's weird. Quick recap, James Bond meets with a French intelligence agent who gives him intelligence and also he has sex. The intelligence said that the globe was in danger by a guy named Drake who was running a party as cover for some nefarious arms deal. Then Bond triggers all the alarms and runs away with the returning character Zoe Nightshade. And during their escape, they have sex. Then he goes to talk to one of Drake's colleagues who switched sides. During this, Bond saves some hostages who promise to have sex. Then the guy dies. Then Bond goes to a skyscraper and gets some intelligence. Then he goes to one of Drake's secret research locations to get some intelligence. Then meets with one of Mayhew's friends who says they're going to have sex, but then shoots Bond in the face. Then the French lady dies, but don't worry because there's a scantily clad Australian to take her place. Then she and Bond make it to Drake's private island before Drake reveals that the arms deal from the beginning of the game was actually a global laser and he's going to murder literally everyone on Earth except for his rich friends. And Bond kills the only woman with any sense of agency and goes into space with a final version of the laser weapon that was being built earlier in the game. Now, to some of you, this may be seen as jumping the shark, the moment when the Grounded series goes completely insane. But I'm here to say that that's uh, true, actually. Like, yeah, that's what happened. But it's at least a little bit smarter than you might think. And if I could find my notes, then I would tell you, but I seem to have misplaced them. Um, this is GoldenEye Part 2. Wait, what? Okay, so I know I've said this like 40 times in this video, and I'm trying not to overstate my case here, but this is the logical progression of the plot of GoldenEye, but in a more action-oriented video gamey format. I lied earlier in the video during the plot summary of GoldenEye. Alex's main motivation wasn't money, but revenge for the British government's mistreatment of his parents, which led to their death. He specifically betrayed the British government, and that was what Bond took umbrage with. James? For England? For England, James? Ah! Nightfire supervillain didn't betray any governments, just the people of Earth. He's the head of a mega corporation which poses as a humanitarian movement, which decommissions nuclear weapons when in reality storing them for his own superweapon. The problem in GoldenEye was bad actors. In Nightfire, the problem is shown as the system which makes these bad actors an inevitable consequence of the distribution of global power. Comrade E.K.S. Am I right? And some of you might be saying, but Tando, this is just the plot of Moonraker, an international corporation run by a man with a goatee trying to overthrow the global powers by posing as an organization trying to advance humankind by way of developing new and wonderful technologies. And to that I say, that's completely correct. But that's exactly what I'm saying. This is cyclical. On European superpowers are constantly fighting new people because in this type of power structure, more and more people will see the hierarchy and try to climb to the top. Let's look back at the introductory sequence just one more time. We are nearly civilized. We will throw this building up just so we can tear it down again. And now is when we talk about the multiplayer. Well, there we go. Well. That's what we need. Many will credit GoldenEye with being the thing that made split screen arena shooters pop off. And I would never deny that. What I am saying is one of the main modes in Nightfire's multiplayer is called Golden Eye Strike. I left it purposely ambiguous earlier, but the rewards for clearing the platinum medals in the campaign missions are being able to play as some of your favorite characters in multiplayer, or you could just use the cheat code party to unlock all characters for your profile. You didn't hear this from me. Getting a silver medal on the exchange gives your profile the ability to play as Odd Job, and that's another thing I haven't mentioned, profiles. You can save your settings to your profile. As in, if you want to use the old control style or dual analog, or if you want to have auto aim during multiplayer, like a lying, cheating. Ho There's also some toggle options or s something, but who really cares? Profiles also track upgrades. You always start with a pistol, but depending on how well you did in the campaign, that can either be a basic PP7, like the one in GoldenEye, or a gold P2K. Of course, we still have to do all the arena shooter elements. You can find an MP5K called the Deutsch M9K. Mm. Jokes aside, the multiplayer goes hard. There's not really very much to say about it other than it's a repeat of Goldeneye. It is truly the successor in every way. It's another iteration of the cycle. All I can really think to say about it is that it's really fun with family and friends. So I'm gonna show you some clips of me playing split screen with my three siblings. Uh, have you found someone you like? <laughs> What if I play as... Uh, it's Vashi Snaps! Guys, I'm laughing. Guys. Ooh, and you're saying professional mode. Oh, guys. Okay. Guys. <laughs> guys. 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 Hey, Lynette. How do you Turn open around. a door? Guys. Yeah, hey! <laughs> so Is that's, it? That's pretty fun. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty fun fun fact. Where are say. you guys? Are you all in this... Stop. Alright, there we go. Oh, how does Leaf, does Leaf have a freaking homing missile? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Gotta, gotta, gotta no! <laughs> no, sorry, I thought you would, would figure it out. I don't have an essay. <laughs> Come on. See, this just seems unbalanced. That's why I like yes. random. You guys just need to go get your own sentinel. 
Or get a sniper and shoot me you from know, across I, the map because a of the Sentinel, varied weapon set that offers for a, you know, very, uh... What the frick are you doing? Get out of here. Hey, no, stop that. Stop that. Oh. <laughs> when? Yeah. You, you must assist. I gotta get it. I gotta get it. I don't... Wait, wait, wait. Get, get wait, wait. I dropped hat. No. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Get Why am I so bad at this? Where are you? I'm going to spectate. I need to observe this battle for you. Hey, can you turn this on? Oh, look at the scope. Charm? Question mark. <laughs> That's great. What does that mean? A what? Uh, oh, for <laughs> See, that. you guys just gotta go get it, and now we're on even footing. I'm, oh. just, like, I'm not exactly right. competent. Oh, Lord. No. You're reasonably competent. Who's going up? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, show us. No, 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 no. Okay. Oh, you got so little help. Hey, 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 no, 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 <laughs> no, <laughs> yes. I didn't know that you like turned I jumped into out. the missile. Oh, frick. I don't want to be a woman. <laughs> Under the bridge. Whoa, the what is this gun? We started with Yo, the laser gun. Why did we start with the sentinel? Well, it, it has infinite ammo, but it can overcharge. Golden gun. Oh, uh, where was that, Lene? <laughs> Oh, oh, that that's song so which you like so much. Play Guys, I just got mine. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get over there? I feel like I'm stuck. Oh. There's a couple Ooh. of ways. I just lost your move. And you just killed me. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Nice. Anders. Oh, I you just kind of walked off. off. I did see uh, the edge. Quick question, where's the flag? Stop. No. Stop. Your mother Stay does. away. Get back here. No. Here oh! Screen I wasn't, you just killed me. And I didn't know you were anywhere from. You know, I'm just gonna let this battle happen. There we go! <laughs> hey, you stop that. Anders, they're looking like down underneath. So I think their flag is in a different spot than us. I don't know where our flag is. Yeah, I don't know where our flag is either. Hey! 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 How does Linnea have a positive KD? Cause she's been murdering me. I'm gonna golden gun you, man. What do you got? Ow, ow. Golden bullets. Golden bullets. <laughs> no. It's a really big problem, and that is that leaf is at our flag right now. Oh. Listen, it's okay. Oh. Oh wait. Can, do you think I can get across the map? Odd job, chat. Oh, oh wait. I'm not odd job. I'm Are going you? to use explosive damage to peek around corners and kill Linnea. Sorry, what were you saying? <gasps> the Deutsch M9K. All right, get over here. Favorite James Bond opening song. One of my favorite intros of all time, really. Really? It's such a classic James Bondy intro. Bro. What about the Attack on Titan season one OP though? I, uh, I don't know actually. Depends. Are you a weeb? Um, is James Bond weeaboo but for Britain? Alexa, play 007 Nightfire by Trey Tuck. Sure. This is Treyarch from Spot. What the? F I'm out of bullets. <laughs> this is so sad. Alexa, play 12 Stout Street. Alexa, play 007 Nightfire. Can you object to have him across the map? Sorry, what were you saying? I don't want to talk about this game anymore. Or should the outro be me saying, Alexa, play 007 Nightfire? And then I use the song 007 Nightfire by Trey Talk. Alexa doesn't know the song that will set fire by Trey Talk, though. What is Trey Talk? Uh, it's a guy with like 50 multi followers who I only discovered because I looked up Golden Eye that will set opening. No, I looked up Nightfire opening and he showed up because his song was named Nightfire. And it's like about nostalgia he has because he used to play that game as a kid. It's like, it's just like us, dude. Can you, can you believe like us? It's just like I'm us. Punch it down. Punch it down. Yeah, baby! This, this is so sad. Oh, th this is so sad. Alexa, play 007 Nightfire by Trey Tuck.